I just wanted to give everyone a quick heads up, uh, a little bit of a content warning. Today we're going to be talking with someone, uh, some sensitive topics. Uh, we talk with somebody that has had a violent past, um, which includes prison time, um, and some of the topics we're going to be talking about are uh, murder, uh, substance abuse, racism, violence, and just general prison life. Um, if any of that disturbs you, uh, you're going to want to skip uh, the first part. I will have a timestamp in the description of where you can skip to to skip all of that, okay? Um, but I just want to give everyone a heads up. Um, if you want to avoid that, please feel free to do so. Um, if not, just be aware that those topics are going to be talked about. Welcome to Curious Joel, a show about curiosity taking us deeper into the topics of people's passion and interesting conversation. I'm your host, Joel Serko. My guest today is Robert Hofstetter. St Hofstadt. Oh my gosh. You know, I have said it right a few times, I oh, swear. Oh, I know you have. Um, say that one more time, please. Hofstadt. Okay. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Awesome. And Robert, what is your passion? My passion is spreading the word of God and Christ and trying to reach at-risk youth to stop them from making the mistakes okay. that I made. And to hone in a little <clears throat> bit more about kind of the, the pivot point that we are, are talking about, what was one of the big things that you did to further that goal? The biggest things I did was I wrote a book on it and I speak and teach okay. and do interviews and all that. Nice. What is the book called? Freeing the Child Inside You by Robert Hofstadt. It's on Amazon. I'm self-published. Okay. And, of course, like everything else, we'll have a link for that in the description below so that you guys can go check it out for yourself. Okay. So, um, what led to that being your passion? Like, what, what went from, like, living your life to this is what I need to kind of dedicate my life to you? Well, what happened was... I'll have to give you a little bit of backstory. Sure. And when I was a young man, just turned 22, I murdered somebody. Okay. I was a drug user, alcoholic. I was self-centered, selfish, and the world belonged to me. And I got sentenced to a 25-year to life prison sentence, and I went to prison for a quarter century. I couldn't even imagine, like... Being in one spot, not being able to like go where I want for 25 years. And it's all you see is cement. And yeah. It's the same program day in and day out. Yeah. Um, so what, what happened in prison? Well, when after I killed the guy, I found all my life I was picked on bullied because back when I was a young kid, they didn't diagnosed dyslexia, ADD, and I had all those things. That's a all, hard life. All as I knew is I was different than other kids and didn't mm -hmm. know why. And that shaped my choices in life growing up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I finally did shoot the person I shot. That was the first time I had a sense of power. Sure. And I didn't want to give that up. So when I went to prison, I became a very violent person in prison for my first 10 years now when you, I was locked You kind up. of took the path. And I'm sorry for the movie movie references. That's about all I know about prison. So I, I apologize. But like like how they talk about a movie, like prison movies was like take down the biggest guy and then well, you become no, like I, you gain respect that way type I, of thing. Actually... I would just go after child molesters and rapists. Be wow, okay. And here's why. Uh huh. If I take you down because you're the biggest guy, you're going to have a friend that wants to take me down because I took huh. you down. <laughs> <laughs> I never really thought about that. That makes a lot of sense, though. <laughs> yeah, because if like, I'm the biggest guy in prison and someone just like knocks me out, I'm going to like, hey, Fred, George, and Billy... I He's the guy. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not surprised that the movies are wrong, but I never thought about like 
the implications of doing that. But okay, so you went after other people to like prove your dominance. Yes, so I, that way I wouldn't have to worry about stabbing someone that say you say you told me, hey, that guy's a rat. Mm-hmm. I go over and stab him up. It turns out he's not a rat. His homeboy's going to want to stab me. Right. So now, as long as you're stabbing a child molester or a rapist, no one's their friend. Right. Nobody hates them. Yeah. So you get to do violence, but you get to preserve yourself and not chance you getting stabbed. So you're you're kind of picking on like the nerdiest nerd oh, in school, like that 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 bully. You bully the weakest person, and no one's going to come rescue the weakest person. And I became the bully because I was bullied. Yeah. And that took me a lot of years to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't ever. Like, I, I've, I've heard a lot of real life stories and know a few, few people, not really personal, like acquaintances, that kind of like that mindset kind of carried on. So, but that carried on, like, you hit a point, a snapping point that sent you to prison, and then you hit, like, you were writing that basically. Oh, yeah. For a while, for a few yes. years. Um, so, like, what changed that from being like, hey, I get to just do whatever I want because I have the power to trying to help others? Like, what was the turning point in there? The turning point was in 2001. Well, it kind of started a little bit sooner as I was in Pelican Bay Shoe, okay. which that's the worst place you can be. And I've got a lot of violence on my jacket for beating people up, mm-hmm. doing all that. Well, some guy... Really quick. Uh, for those that don't know what a jacket is... Oh, <laughs> so okay, like, okay. So for those that are like, imagine like some sort of jacket that just no, says violence, I'm sorry. violence, violence. Let me be, let me be. Okay. More. We like to clarify because not everybody knows everything. Okay. So what's okay. a jacket? <laughs> what's a jacket it would pretty much be your resume, what you've done. Okay, but I'm guessing this isn't for like Walmart. No, it's not. For, <laughs> no, this is... I stabbed this guy ten times. I stabbed this guy five times. I beat up five Mexicans. I beat up three blacks. I did this. Uh-huh. I was in a race war on this yard, which is a fight where the whole yard goes off between races. Okay, I have to, I, just because people are listening to this, and normally I'd get to this question later, but just so that people understand, that's not who you are right now anymore. No. Okay. No, I, I just wanted to <laughs> clear no, that up. No, I let go of that many years People ago. are listening like, well, he's got a racist on his program. I, I'd probably get shut down pretty quick. No. So that's, that was your first, like, 10 years yes. in prison. Yes. Okay. So, and your, your criminal record, your jacket, yes. Yes. Uh, had gotten a lot of violence on it, a lot yes. of, like, uh, so assaults. for prisoner-wise... I was looking pretty good. Right. Well, one guy that PC'd, which was locked up, he wouldn't go to yard and do what he was supposed to do. Well, he smutted me up. In other words, what's smutting up is he talked bad about me. Mm-hmm. So then he sent word to where I lived in the module mm-hmm. and saying that, hey, I'm no good. Right. So now when my celly heard that... Mm-hmm. And the neighbor got the kite. He goes, well, you know, you've been in my cell for six months. You know, you're you're good. I've read all your paper, which would be all my 115, everything I've done. 115? That's a write-up for when you're bad. Okay, so in prison, that that's like, yeah, that's, like, like yeah. a note from your teacher. Saying, again, it, prison to school, because that's, again, yeah, trying it, to equate it, it to something it, else. In other words, I had a whole stack of F report cards at my... Okay. That the teacher sent home to Gotcha. Mom. But yeah. I wore those proud because those Fs were yeah, good to in, get in. Yeah, in, in prison, that's a, a, a good rep, a good yeah. reputation in prison. Yes. You're a bad dude. You fit in with the crowd. Yes. Gotcha. And so my Sally tells me, he goes, look, I don't believe this. But here's, here's, here's what's going to happen. The other whites... This is, I'm still racist at this time. Uh-huh. Not anymore. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's so referring white, to a specific group yes, of people. Um, yes. And in prison, you're pretty much beholden to be whatever one, you are. Yeah, whatever you are. Gotcha. So what he did is he goes, look, I'm going to talk for you. 
but it's going to go to a vote of all the whites in here. Mm -hmm. If they vote yes, you know that you're no good one. I got to kill you. Wow. If they vote no, you get a stay. You're not allowed to leave the cell until the vote's in. Like, I couldn't oh, even gosh. leave my cell for a shower. That's so, terrifying. So he went out for showers, and I'm standing in my And in Pelican Bay, you, you couldn't get out of a cell without getting killed if they wanted to get you. Right. So it's like I stood in the cell, waited like 15 minutes while he went out, talked. Came back. He goes, "Well, you got the vote. You know, you get a you get a stay." Okay. <laughs> I was like, "The vote? What does the which one?" <laughs> There's two I vote, I'm still talking to you, Joel. Okay. I, so well, that's the vote. No, the I, vote I, was for me to stay, <laughs> uh -huh. and it was based on my record over what someone else said. Right. And actions versus words. Yes, and that was kind of one of the points that made me start thinking. A little bit. What am I doing this for? Right. You know what? It's like I built a 10-year resume that's really good and all with one dude's mouth. It almost came crumbling down completely. Oh, what? A, I, but here, here's the thing, too. It's, and you'll, you'll ask this question later, <laughs> is it got to the point, too, and it like really why I go to my wanting to help others and Mm -hmm. My God aspect is my passion is I was trying to hold on too tight to this physical. Right. For what? When I know what my eternal home was going to be. But I wasn't smart enough yet to figure that out. Sure. But I was doing everything I could. I would do something to you first if I even thought you were doing something to me. Right. So I was fighting pre, for this. Pre-retaliation. <laughs> yes. It's yes. like, I'm going to punch you. Why? I think you were thinking about possibly punching so me. I'm gonna punch so I'm going to punch you just in case. Yes. <laughs> and that that was it. So we'll, we'll get into more of that. So that was like a little bit of like, okay, what am I doing? A, a bit of a wake-up call going like, okay, so 10 years worth of effort and work that almost was nothing because one guy said something and yes. like it's like okay then what's the point and honestly if the guys i was with weren't guys that had been down a long time and like ogs oh, mm -hmm. i probably wouldn't have got that vote because the new breed of people they don't care right oh, it's just safer to kill them worry about it later sure <laughs> I mean, that, that goes into this better safe than sorry if you're not if you're not 100 percent sure about somebody you'd rather have you know Yes. It cleaned, then, oops, we messed up. <laughs> yes. From their perspective, at least. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And yeah, so that's that was one of my biggest ones. Then, when I got out of the shoe and I went down to New Folsom, I got in a men's group and, you know, started to unravel myself and start doing deep introspection work, like looking within and what my wake up was is in the midst of that group that's when the Holy Spirit physically touched me okay and when he touched me it just changed me I okay. knew my violence was over mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be violent anymore I still struggled with substance abuse for a few more years okay you know and then I finally was able to get all all that and the reason i struggle with the substance abuse is i wasn't doing violence anymore but my justification yeah. was okay well i'm not going to be violent but i'll move a kite and contraband for you so i was still doing my part because i was still in high security level four and you're pretty much your race is your race and right. you try and pull back from your race you die right and so I was able to, you know, explore that. But what was so great to where you see where with Jesus' plan and mm -hmm. God's plan for me was I started going to church. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, the whites didn't like people going to church. The young, the young guys. Well, they also, a lot of them are scared and wouldn't stab somebody. They'll fight you, but they're not willing to pick up steel yeah so they're more of the the idealists 
of like, I don't like the idea of this, but they would never actually act on that ideal. And see, here's the thing. So because of my pr- my prior resume, mm-hmm. they were careful how they got at me because in their paranoid mind, I might not have stabbed anybody in like seven years, but doesn't but you're mean I forgot. still the same guy. Yes. <laughs> like, it's not like that's their. How they, does this work? I don't. Like, it's not yes, something that's, you say, Oops, I that's forgot what how to do it. Prison's paranoia. Right. So it's like, because of my bad, it allowed me to explore the good. You're still the bad, tough dude. And so they're like, whoa. They, okay, think, cool. I, they think I am. Well, yeah, in and their that's, eyes. It's in perception. Their eyes, it's, it's uh, well, let's let's not test to see if this is just an act or whatever. Yes, or like, yes. how deep this goes, you know. Yeah. And so that kind of protected you. Yes. Kind of incidentally. Of yes. like, well... I don't like what he's doing, but I'm not willing to risk him actually, like, going back to what I know him to be. <laughs> yes. Gotcha. That's really interesting. Yes. That's very it's... interesting. Okay. So, um, in prison, you went from this very violent lifestyle to, um, to almost, like, instantly nonviolent. Yes. Um, out of curiosity, uh, so you were saved in prison. Yes. Was that that moment? Or I was had, that before um, before that moment? Like, Well, before that moment, now I got to quantify this too. Okay. For many years, I followed the Church of Jesus Christ Christian. And what that was is that was a white separatist movement. Not supremacist, separatist. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the premise of that like all the Bible studies I did, is God loves everybody in the world. He created everybody. Uh He just doesn't like race mixing. Because now you go back, what what does he do with Israel? You don't marry those people, you don't marry these people that are part of your lineage. When Noah got on the ark, he took animals after their own kind by twos. Okay. Okay. The Jews were his chosen people. Yeah. But Esau got rid of his birthright when he sold it to Jacob for some red pottage and some food. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, that made the whites like God's chosen people. (laughs) Okay. So just so that everyone listening to this can tell, I am very confused and my face is very much showing this confusion because this doesn't make any sense. Okay, but... Uh, But that's kind of where where their thought process came from. Yes, and that was, I followed that for a lot of years. Okay. So, I mean, I didn't hate other races. It just, you shouldn't race mix. Well, and I know I know you don't believe that anymore. No, I married a very beautiful Hispanic woman. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was like, I was at that wedding, and uh, it was amazing. And so if you still think that, then you need to look at your marriage a little bit. Oh. Um, so, yeah, obviously a lot has changed. Yes. Um, so you, you were in prison. You had that life-changing moment that you went from a murderer and a violent, violent prisoner to... A believer, a a a churchgoer, a teacher, in a, a, yeah. And so, what does that like after that change? What does that kind of look like um, after? Like, I'm sure eventually that stigma of this is a bad dude, this is a violent dude. I don't want to mess with him. Did that ever wear off? Did you ever like well, have a moment where it the it on the one eighties it. It never really wears off. Gotcha. Because, see, in prison, <clears throat> that mentality is you, 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 never, you never lose it, you know? And it's like everybody in, who does stuff in prison, everybody's doing it out of being scared. Right. You know, it's like a big old pile of everyone scared being crazier than the next to get yeah. to the top. Right. I never wanted to be at the top because once you get to the top, You're the, the person uh, the person underneath you wants to chop you down. Right. So I never I could have had yards. I never did anything with the power I could have had. Right. And okay. people ask, well, why don't you I don't want yards. And here you take the yard. You what, want what, it. what does that mean exactly? What does that having means, a yard mean? Having the yard would mean I would dictate the program for my race on that yard. 
Okay, so you're like top dog yes. of that like yes area mm-hmm. for at least your section of the prison. Yes, my my race. All right. the whites in the prison would do what I say. Gotcha. So and you you were in a spot that you could have done that if you oh, so yes. chose, but I but didn't. you didn't. No, because just what I said, it goes back to the politics of why only stab child molesters and rapists right is if i have someone stabbed on a yard or say you're what's the big homie you're in the shoe you're mm. the big gangster you send me a kite here you gotta you gotta stab this guy sorry a kite uh, a letter like okay. you send me a letter okay a little little kite to someone hoops in their butt and brings out from the shoe oh you send me this letter and you say hey this guy's gotta go he's no good Gotcha. Okay, then I'm getting ready to line you up. Hey, Joel, it's your turn to go stab him. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. getting you lined up on him. A day later, I get a guy from another big homeboy. Oh, yeah, hey, don't stab that dude. It was a mistake. Right. Now I got two kites with two crazy dudes that are on. that what do you do? Right. If I stab him, he's going to be mad at me. If I don't, the other <laughs> one's going to be <laughs> Why would I want to be a shot caller? Right, but That's people a lot of pressure. in the and sick mind of prison, people it's strive worth, for it's that. worth it for some other people in different yes. mindsets. No, ninety percent. Yeah, I never understood it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's something that I think a lot of humans struggle with. Is like, you know, they want more and more and more, and then they realize, oh wait, that means everything else underneath me is also wanting the same thing, and I now I'm in their way. Yes, very good way. Yeah. No, I, that, yeah, that's a very interesting mentality, which, you know, I mean, I, I also never quite got, like, I, I've been asked at my, my day job, um, like, hey, so when are you going to, you know, take over the camp? I'm like, never, <laughs> I'm never going to take over this camp. I'm not, I am not CEO material. I'm not executive director material. No, I, I, I'm good at handling a small amount of people. I'm good at handling my stuff, but I always... Like, as far as I can tell, I always want to be able to go back to somebody and be like, hey, so just really quick, does this make sense to you? <laughs> like, yeah. And like, with my podcast, I, I am it. Like, I can ask my wife a few questions. I have a few friends that I can be like, hey, does this make sense? But like, at the end of the day, it's still my call. Like, okay, is this what I'm doing? Yeah. So like, that to me is a little scary. But like, I don't understand why everyone's like, I want to be the biggest. You guys like, you realize you get the blame for everything that yes. goes wrong with your company, whether you knew about it or not, right? It's like, oh, yes. Well, that's not that bad. I'm like, mmm. <laughs> so, but you, you never had that desire. And is that because that, that was because you, you had that turning point at like, at no, I or never was that had just it. ever. It was ever, never, okay. ever. Because I didn't want to die. <laughs> so you, you were playing few... that like that fear versus scared, like causing fear. Well, but because you're scared of things, kind of walking that balanced line of like, be scary enough that other people don't want to do anything to you, but don't be too scary that other people do want to do something to you. Yes. And so you were like walking that narrow line throughout, like throughout your 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 prison sentence yeah. and then you had that 10 year mark where you got saved and then did that like did that change the like how you thought about that that thing at all like that that line or did it change your perspective like were you still kind of like I don't want to like stir the pot at all I just want to kind of stay in the middle or was it then focused more on like I don't care as much about all well, of that and it was Kind of like, I don't care as much, but it was still self-preservation. Sure, sure. You know, it was self-preservation, and then it took a few more years for self-preservation to go away. And that's when I talk about holding on to the physical life too tight. Okay. I'm like, I'm in prison. I'm never getting out of prison. I'm going to die in prison. Why am I trying so hard to stay alive in prison? I know right. what my reward is when I die. Gotcha. Yet, I'm doing everything I can not to die. Right. So, let's go to that that spot where 
you know, you, you were able to let go of things and the, and the prison and that whole lifestyle. Let, let's start from there. Like, what did that look like moving forward? Well, what it looked like, it, when the Holy Spirit physically touched me, mm-hmm. it changed me to my core mm-hmm. in my spirit. But you got to remember, I still have my physical. Right. And so what I had to do is I had to do a lot of work on the physical aspect of me. And that's what that group was to start pulling apart everything I thought I was. Right. Not who I was, who I thought I was. Right. And And there's a big difference between those two. Yes. Yes. And, you know, this group, this man's group inside circle I was part of, and Mm -hmm. it's under the Mankind Project out here, which is the man's... The men's movement, which pretty much their motto in the short sense is, if every man takes responsibility for his own action, you can change the world one one man at a time. Because really you're not cool. gonna you're not gonna have wars. Because yeah. you're not gonna be mad at me because you're yeah. Picky. If if I messed up, I'm not gonna get mad at you for you know. Well, you yeah. confused me and it's your fault. Like it's like oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's if my everyone bad. if no. everyone took responsibility for their own actions, you think how great this world would be. You would have no conflict. You would have mm-hmm. no, and that was what their. That's pretty much in a nutshell. And I did their trainings out here. I was part of those groups out here in gotcha. San Diego, and that was it. Allowed me to, you know, really explore myself. Mm-hmm. And the more I was able to peel the onion of Robert, mm-hmm. you know, and break the different facets of me and see. That was like the slow process of change. And that's what I tell people. Like, I, I'm the, my heart was granted in the good Lord. He changed it, but he had to chip away at it a little later. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. instantaneous. Sure. And that's one thing I used to get mad at. I struggle with behavior, drugs, and alcohol yeah. all my life. I hear the praise report of your chap. Oh man, I got down, said this. I got no desire to use or drink again. I'm, and I'm like, really, dude? Yeah. I've been saying that same prayer for five years, right. and I'm still struggling yeah. in my. And, and that, that that is something that's frustrating is when like, and and this this goes across a lot of things. Like I know I I've been envied before because there are certain things that I just pick up naturally. And I'm like, I'm, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not purposely trying to do this like instantly. I just know it. And there's other things that like people are like, dude, why haven't you figured this out yet? I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I just don't, I'm not, it's not clicking in my brain. Yeah. I have to do the work to get it there. And other things I don't. And, like, and, and that's, that was pretty much, I had to do the work. And right. what I say and why I so much, my passions to help others is I was able to see when I could get out of my own way, then the Holy Spirit could open up and work work in me more. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I I had a crack this wide to let let His right. light in, but each time I started figuring out the bad stuff mm-hmm. of what made me do it, it got bigger. Mm-hmm. And then now more light can get in, and more yeah. light, and pretty soon, and it was as like the, I do, the hole in the dam where it's yes, like as it now, leaks, the yes. more it leaks, and the more it leaks, and, the more it leaks. And here was the biggest one I got on that was I was doing good, and you know I wanted to know every facet of my personality. Mm-hmm. You know, now I I believe people have multiple personalities. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not in a sense like <clears throat> uh, different the, whole character. Yeah, it's just it's different like facets you just got different different voices in your head, or, or like different modes. Yeah, different modes. Okay. And when I started deciphering, I found mm-hmm. out that my main one I was writing on, he was called Hard Rob. I identified him. Okay. And Hard Rob allowed me to survive in where I was at. It allowed me to do... Remember, I'd never been violent all my life. Right. It allowed me to be the person I became. It allowed me to disregard your life. It allowed me to disregard everything. So I was trying to not let him be so much in control. Yeah. He was the the hard shell. Yes, he was the, the hard shell. The protector of like, not letting like the guilt and yes. all of those things like, yes. creep in. It was like, this is yeah. just what I have to do. 
Yes. Gotcha. And so I was starting to work on him, mm-hmm. and everything came easy, like letting go of everything. But it was hard to let go of that, so I'm doing a lot of work with facilitators, other men, helping me. And what I found out it was, and, you know, my book, I got some poetry I wrote in the back of it. Okay. And one's called Armor, and that's what this piece of work was about, is I honestly, as we're sitting here talking, I believed if Hard Rob would have went, went away, I would have disappeared. He was me. I didn't know who I was outside of him. Gotcha. So that was, I was finally able to see that. You know, I'm like, okay, Mm. so what if I disappear? If I quit existing? It doesn't matter, but that was like my culminative piece that once I was able to get him out of control. Gotcha. You know, and it, it made it hard. Because mm-hmm. now I had to deal with prison as a real human being and not <laughs> a shutdown psychopath. Sure, sure. I mean, <laughs> but that's where the Holy Spirit kept working in me. Mm-hmm. And it's like every step I took, he guided me on the way. It wasn't instantaneous. It was sure. like a, a work in progress. Right. Because like I said, I'm the slow one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. And sometimes that work makes it more meaningful even. So Yeah. Um, so moving forward, I, that, there's a lot that I could, I could keep asking. I could, I could talk for like a whole day with you about everything because there's a lot that goes into like the product that came out of that. Because yes. besides you coming out a changed man, there was something else inside you that you wanted to get out and share with other people. Yeah. So no. let's, let's talk about that book. Okay. okay. So what led you to writing that book? Like, what was that process to like, okay, this is something that I need to get out of my brain on paper and into other people's hands. Well, what, what led me to write it was when I first got released. Mm-hmm. Remember, I was released into a strange world. When I went into prison, there was no cell phones and no internet. Okay, really quick. I just, so I can, everyone can have a time frame for this. When did you go into prison? When did you get released? 1989, 1989, 2015. Wow. That's long before, not long. That's before (laughs) I was born to, um, that was like a few years before I started working at the camp. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i wow, think we started around the same time yeah i think so um so that's that's a significant chunk of advancement and technology that you missed out on um that you're you're going from like you said you said before cell phones yeah brick phones yeah like the you're talking about the car phones <laughs> yes okay it's so like the old james bond like car phone <laughs> and then you come out to like the you know iphone Yes. You know, and In going the like, Android. Yeah. You're like, okay, now I can touch a screen and things happen. That's, that was, that that's was, like a time travel movie right there. And it was hard. Sure. It was hard. And, but getting back to what really led to that book is, you know, I've always had the, what the Holy Spirit gave me and what God gave me, I want to give away. Okay. So what led to the book is, was really sad is I was in San Diego in a halfway house, which is a place when you get out of prison, you go to to help you readjust. Sure. To it's, society. It's, because it's, I was out of society a long time. Yeah. And it also, like, is that the moment, I'm guessing the moment you get out of prison, you don't have, like, time to, like, find an apartment before they let you out or anything. And you'd have to have money for that, too. Right. So, like, the halfway house. I got house, $200 gate money. That's what they God. give you. Yeah. So, like, the halfway house is, like, a spot that you can, like. Yes. You have some time to like, yes, st- like get your sea legs, so so to speak. Like, yes. like okay, this is what the world's like. I can get a job. I can start making money. Then I can actually afford to yes. live on my own. Not in San Diego, though. Well, okay, <laughs> that's a different that's a different topic entirely. But like, so, that's the idea behind yeah. it, though. And so, what happened was what really led me to writing that book is. When I had free time, they gave us a bus pass. 
Okay. Now, uh, if anyone who knows San Diego, if you got a bus pass, you can go anywhere between the buses and the trolleys. Hmm. So when I had free time, I would just hop on buses, take it to the red line, the blue line, all mm-hmm. the trolleys, and I would just ride all over San Diego just seeing the signs because I would looked at cement walls for 25 years. And right. Else. You know, and I will say San Diego has a lot of different sites you can yes. see, and it's... I would almost say polar opposite to concrete walls because yes. you have beach that is just wide open ocean oh, and yes. you have like the, the Balboa Park that is like gardens and things. And, yes. you know, like, I think I said that one right. I get them, that one and another part confused. I get the names confused, but yeah. But you have like the botanical gardens, you have the San Diego Zoo, you have like these open spaces, you have the beaches, you have the yes. city. Like it's almost, I would say, polar opposite to yes. a concrete Whoa. And what really led to this book is, you know, when I would ride the buses and trolleys. Mm-hmm. Now, I used to ride the bus when I was a kid. Sure. You know, bus is where you made friends and socialized. Mm-hmm. Well, when I got on this bus, everyone was on their cell phone stuck. <laughs> yeah. No one was talking. Everyone right. was on their phones. And a, a insight came to me. I said, wow. I might have been locked up in prison against my will for 25 years, but society as a whole built their own prison hmm. right in their phone because Interesting. nothing outside of that matter. Sure. They'll bump into you. No right. excuse me, no, no, just keep on trucking. Don't right. even look up from their phone. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's like, wow, I might have been in prison, a physical prison, but 90% of the people, they built their own prison. Right. Okay. You know, and so that really led me to want to write the book. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, what, what, what is the book about? Like, if, well, if you're to, it, to describe the book to somebody, what, what is it? What, what it pretty much is, is it just a book and various exercises and meditations in it mm-hmm. that you do that quiet your mind enough and let you identify your stuck parts. Gotcha. And once you've ident you've got to go to a group or you got to go get someone that can help you with them Mm -hmm. and it's getting past them so you can become who you were meant to be. Now me, you know, I'm a child of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's just me. I'm I'm not saying everybody is. And what I saw in men, the men's group I was in, from the hardest gang members all across the board, when they started breaking through their barriers, there was one common theme that ran across everything. Okay. And I would say it runs across out here too. It's, I wanted to matter. Sure. I want to matter. Yeah. It gets down to that. And yeah, I mean, I, I even struggle with that sometimes with, I mean, with my podcast, like my podcast is an outlet for my curiosity and my creativity, but there's sometimes I'm like, wow, I don't have a lot of views. I like as many as I'd want. And like, I want to be more relevant to other people. And I struggle with that sometimes. And I'm like, that's not why I'm doing it. I'm not doing this to get views. I'm not doing this so that people just come listen to me. I'm doing this for my creativity. I'm doing this so that uh, the people like you get can get their story out and can both People can find out what what goes on behind the scenes of different people and also like educate people a little bit about like all the work that goes into all these different passions that different people have. And like I have to remember like sometimes I have to reset myself like this isn't about me. (laughs) This isn't my like this isn't like well Joel Serco needs his name in like I need to be headlining eventually like I need to be at like you know the, the different like podcast cons and stuff like that. I need to you know. I have to remember, this isn't, that's not what this is about. And so, like, even I struggle with that, like, being relevant and being being and, needed. And what the book helps people see is, you know, how to break down every story. We call, I call them stories, traits I took on that you put on me that aren't me. You're not good enough. Okay, I take that on. Okay, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart. The labels that other people give you. Yes. And it's about being able to start peeling those away to find your true inner child. And here's what I found. Mm -hmm. Why, like, you look at the artwork on the cage, it's 
it's a kid, someone in a cage with a kid taking his hand to get him out of the cage. Because of my circumstances at a young mm -hmm. age, being dyslexic, poor and club footed, not being able to learn, and my trauma, I locked my little kid in a cage yeah. for a lot of years, a yeah. long, long time. And I was able to, through the process of seeing that that's not me, that's not me, mm -hmm. I was able to open the cage and yeah. let him out. Just and when I let him out, I could hear him laugh. Right. Out of curiosity, do, do you know the term masking? Um, so in in the ADHD community, and there's a few other like neurodivergent uh, communities. So anybody that their brain isn't built normally, so like dyslexia, ADHD, ADD, you know, anybody on the spectrum. Oftentimes, what happens is society has this expectation of how you're supposed to act and how your brain is supposed to work. And if it doesn't work that way, well, you're the one that needs to change, not us. That's, and so that's me. What that what that's called is called masking. It's okay. you you're putting on a normal mask of yes, I function that way too. Me too. And like the smile and thumbs up, twinkle. <laughs> See, I'm normal just like you. And you know, you go on with that and then like what often ends up happening is like at the end of the day of like trying to pretend to be normal all day, you get home and you're just exhausted from trying to yes. pretend that like nothing's wrong with me. Even though that's true, it's you're saying it in the wrong mindset of like, yeah, I mean, so I have undiagnosed ADHD, which is what ADD has been bundled under. Um, but, you know, and there's times where I'm like, I had to pay, sit down and pay attention through this whole meeting that was, to me, very boring at the time. And I get home, I'm just exhausted because I was forcing myself to pretend to be normal or whatever. Yeah, you know, and that's and it's an exhausting, exhausting well, it, thing. It is, and that's what you know. The that's why I wrote the book to help people unravel yeah. that, so they can get back. And here's the biggest thing I saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I was raised Christian, and I turned my back on church. I was sure. forced to go to Bible book vocation school in the summertime. Mm -hmm. I hated it. I was forced to go on the church campouts. Right. The youth groups mm -hmm. stand around the fire. Kumbaya, handshake. <laughs> oh, gosh. You couldn't, a boy and girl couldn't get up yeah. from the fire and leave together. Right. But two boys and two girls could get up and leave the campfire together. Right. Well, you walk 10 feet, you're pitch black. You could separate it. Right. So it's like I was very rebellious on that. Sure. So. And, and being forced to do anything doesn't usually turn out very well. You know, I, I, yeah, my wife had, was forced to be like watch Star Trek and I'm like, I'm so sorry. He was like, so she's, she's tired of it, which I, I, I can understand. I'm a big Trekkie fan. Um, but like, I also understand like, you know, I've been forced to watch things or do things or be a part of things. I'm like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> like it's, it's overdone and oversaturated without me being a willing participant in it. Yes. And that ends up usually bad like it kind of did for you like you know it led to you turning your back on that stuff for yes. a good while yes um before you you came to discover it for yourself and that's part of why i wrote the book is and it's i saw that once people got out of their own way or sure. they let that pride go to the side <clears throat> then they were open Mm -hmm. for the Holy Spirit. They were open for God. They mm -hmm. could see that, like with me, you know, I blame God. He shouldn't have let me shoot that guy. He shouldn't have made me a drug guy. He shouldn't have done this. Yeah. Well, when I woke up and saw, I saw that he was carrying me yeah. through mm -hmm. that and had a plan for me that I couldn't see for myself. Yeah. So unraveling all that mm -hmm. and getting out of my own way that was my passion for writing the book mm -hmm. is to give people pretty much locked in technology. You yeah. know, like I got my nephew. I'd go over and see him. He's straight, straight on video games. Right. You know, it's like I was worried about him. He's playing GTA. And so I'm trying it. My thumbs don't work. <laughs> I, I, I can't play. I, yeah. I try. My thumbs don't work that way. 
So he's not even trying to steal stuff. He's straight stabbing and shooting people in GTA. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm getting ready. I'm watching him. I'm like, I got a, I got a very disturbed nephew. Then he goes, oh, let me show you my Minecraft. Mm-hmm. And then he switched gears to Minecraft. And he showed me his whole fortress he built. Yeah. And I, I'm scratching my head. Yeah. Like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> I don't... I, this is, it's like the switching gears. Yeah. You know, it's like from, well, I, I, I just want to say like, if I play some violent video games, um, but something that I've realized and I, I, because I, I've, I grew up listening to how like violent video games make violent people. And I, I have, I, for one, like, I was like, well, whatever I play on a video game to me is very clearly not reality. And what I found and what I think they've had studies for, and I, I'm not going to try and quote them. So audience, if you find that this is wrong, just let me know kindly and send me information on it. But what I've, the things I've read, it was like that the violent video games don't lead to violent people. <laughs> um, and that oftentimes it's more of as weird as it sounds, like even the violent ones are just a creative outlet as far as like how the it's perceived by the brain is it's not like, and you know, you you can have your opinions on GTA. I'm I'm fine with that. I don't I don't really have a personal stake in that. But like, violence in video games isn't necessarily going like, hey, this is okay to do to real people. And well, you can and see that when you switch over to any other video game that's not violent, is they're just excelling at whatever the game is putting in front of them. Yeah, and in whatever creative he, manner. And he's not violent at all. But it's like it would you just see my, those things. I'm, I'm just you, remember, I wasn't raised in that. Right. No, I, so I understand it's like, that. And uh, you go watch him doing the things that got you into prison for 25 years, and you're going, um... <laughs> uh, I think I need to talk to my nephew. Right. I and don't... so, like, that, that so- social change of, like, yes. what, like, if that video game had, like, someone who were do- playing that at the arcade when you were a kid, you know, parents would be in writing, right? And then oh, you're yeah. going like, oh, yeah, this is just one of the pop- most popular games now. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, but, like, and that's something that's difficult for me because, like, I I mean, obviously, I like nature. I work at a camp outdoors. But I'm also our IT tech AV guy at the camp. So, like, I also know that tech can also be helpful if it's used correctly. Yes. And so, like, there, I, like I said, I play some violent video games. Because it's a nice relaxing thing for me to do sometimes. I but would, I also play I, the I would too if I could take my thumbs up <laughs> work a palsy. I tried up here. Oh gosh. I yeah. tried who uh who's the big guy with the glasses? Uh William? William. Mm. I I asked William. Now I know William's got a lot of patience. Yes, he he's does. a he's a he's a very nice so when I was at one time it was just me and him in the game room at Camp One. Mm-hmm. So it's like no one was on the games, and you know I could see his patience. As I said, okay, and I used an unpolitical correct term, and I said, okay, I I want to try call the black the call the ops the helicopter the black so, ops black ops. Call I go any black ops. Yes, I go. I want to try that. Can you please put it on? Like I'm sorry <laughs> for using the word retard mode. That a five year put it on five year old. <laughs> that a five, five year old mode. Yes. In other words, so he's showing me what to do. Uh huh. You know, and he's like, I can't walk. I can't walk. Look and shoot. <laughs> so he goes, follow your leader. Look, just what? Just, okay, that's your gun. Look up. Hey. <laughs> wall, wall, wall. Yeah. Oh, you're dead. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> my my thumb. They're just, they're not they're not learned in that way. They don't no, have that muscle they're, memory. No, they they're, grow up they're not. You that, know that, that stuff. But I mean, if I could, I I like. Yeah. It. it looks like a fun game. Yeah. Uh, but it's like that was. He sat with me. It's like yeah. about twenty minutes. I yeah. gave it a scout's try. No, <laughs> I really tried. Yeah. It's like yeah. Okay. Um. But yeah. So it's just you came back to a very different environment yes. and like things that 
would have come up as like red flags back in your day. Oh, they're normal. Yeah, and it's just like, oh yeah, I guess that's just a thing people do. It doesn't mean he's a psychopath. No, you know? I learned that real quick from <laughs> yeah. my thirteen-year-old nephew. Yeah, but but there is still that idea of like you know a, a slave almost to your technology. You know, like yeah. it, it's it's in control of you. Of like you know, and that's one thing I saw in. What goes to, it's not a video game that makes you violent. It's a video game. And what I look at is I do a lot of study on the human psyche. I mm-hmm. studied it for years. Yeah. And one thing I see is, like, I've been on the side of seeing violence. Right. I've seen dudes killed in front of me. Mm-hmm. I've seen blood and guts. I've made blood and guts and I look at like the school shootings or the mass shootings Mm -hmm. and one thing I've seen out here it's like there's not the face to face aspect that I grew up with it's in your headphones playing you're still as a group but you're just all you're all in battle together so Mm -hmm. it's like what I'm seeing in the kids nowadays is it's like we're sitting face to face looking at each other and not, right where there's a whole generation that they're pretty much be sitting on the couch next to each other both on their computer screens not even paying it right so when it comes to doing that act out they're really not looking at another human being as human it's more right. like they don't have that it's kind of disassociated yeah it's just because they're not playing with cars in the dirt anymore <laughs> right. You know, it's like they're not everybody's hopping on their bike to ride Denny Venture. Right. You know. Yeah. We okay. drank out I drank out of the garden hose and survived. <laughs> <laughs> My nephew like wouldn't shirts. drink out of the garden hose. Yeah. Oh, no. they gotta have bottled water. I drank tap water yeah. and survived. Oh no, that's copy bottled water. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. So and that's yeah. That's one thing. And this is only my personal perception sure. as I sure. see. It's like with the disassociation, I disassociated. And mm-hmm. that allowed me to live in a heinous environment. Well, yeah, and that, that's your, your hard Robert, as you yes. call them, is like it's the I don't pretending hard enough, I don't care about this, that it becomes somewhat of a reality. But the problem it became is became my whole reality. Well, well, the problem, and this is from what I've understood about things, is that even though you have that hard persona that you, that that mode you put out, all that stuff is still having an effect. It's just affect, affecting some smaller mode that's in the back of my mind somewhere that's still taking all that damage, that all that guilt, all that everything, all that grief, all that regret is still. It's not just disappearing. It's not bouncing mm-hmm. off. It's just getting tucked away very tightly in this small little well, cavern and, back there. And that's what my book's for, right. is to pull that out and let it go. And when I was able to pull my child out of the cage mm. and make a safe place for him within me, yeah, then I start, I can forgive him mm-hmm. because he was a kid. It wasn't his fault. Right. What happened to him? Mm-hmm. They didn't diagnose her. There was no spectrum when I was growing sure, up. Sure, sure. So, like, once and then I can acclimate him into me, mm-hmm. you know, and say, I got you now. You yeah. know, I, I'll i protect you. You're safe to come out. Well, then, like, that stuff that wants to be hidden in the recess and the crevices, it starts to go away because I start becoming, I call it a whole human being. Sure. Not just... Not the what, pieces. Not the pieces not, not, that this you're not is protecting. Hard Robert and Child Robert and then yeah. Sensitive Robert. You're just Robert. Robert. Interesting. And so th- this book is designed to kind of help you yeah. work through that. And I give I give examples in the book of how because I've studied psychology for a lot of, a lot of years. Mm-hmm. You know, I've read everything on psychology, all all the books, and I've help I can't even count the number of guys I helped mm-hmm. you know change their life I mean they made the choice yeah but I was able to lead them from behind mm-hmm. and help them see that you're not the sum of what you think you are sure okay 
so with the book, um, there's also a ministry that kind of goes along with it, correct? Uh, yes, it does, because pre-COVID, mm-hmm. like my church, my pastor, to show you how funny it is, a year out of prison, when I came up to the mountains in Anza, mm-hmm. I became the Sunday school teacher in my church. Yeah. The 5 to 12 year olds. Yeah. The little kids. And my pastor, you know, he he says, he goes, look, the only story people need to know from you is murder Sunday school teacher. <laughs> 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 what, more can, what more can you say? Yeah. And what was so nice about that is I was able to introduce a whole generation. Like I bring, if they would be good and do their lessons, you know, mm. I would let him watch YouTube. So I introduced all generation to Davy and Goliath. Do you Though, know yeah, what that no, is? I, I grew up watching that. My parents, yeah, my parents. They were like, that. oh, man. They were like, just they would get through their lessons so they could watch versions yeah. of that. So audience, Dave, Davy and Goliath is an old show. Um, it was... Stop animation, correct? It's been a while since I've actually watched it, so my brain's a little fuzzy on like well, what it actually was. But it was stop animation, claymation. Yeah, claymation. Yeah. And it was a dog, a boy and his dog that would go on adventures, and, and the dog kind of talked, kind of Scooby Doo ish. The the dog talked to the boy and tried yeah. to keep him out of trouble, but the yeah. boy wanted to get in trouble, and yeah. the boy always said he was sorry and repented in the end. Yeah, as the yeah. adventure. Yeah. Oh, Davy, we ought to do that. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was inter- able to introduce them really cool. to a generation that yeah. never saw it to try and do that. Because see, here's for me, and it goes back to my passion mm-hmm. is my road to no good started when I was really young, right? Because of <clears throat> situations and culminations. Yeah. The so it's like I want to try and instill and give the most I can mm-hmm. to kids, to youth, to the young people. Yeah. You know, to try and give them the shot. Mm-hmm. You know, as they mature that they don't walk away from Christ when they start becoming an adult. Right. And there's really in church, you know, you got youth and once you turn like eighteen There's really not something in the middle to get you over to regular church. And there's a lot of drop-off Yes, at that age. And that's what one thing that, you know, my to try and address that is to give you the sustainability and the learning to Mm. carry that through. And one way was my passion was that book is if, I'm not in my head, I'm out of my way, right. I'm not stuck on my pride, I stand a better chance at making right. it through that gap. Yeah, and I, I like how you say, like, if, I, if I'm if i not in my way, you know, because yes. I think that's a lot of people in a lot of different situations and stuff like that. And, like, if if your book is helping people kind of step out of their own way and let them do what makes the most sense versus just, like, well... So and so said I'd never do this, so I have to go do that to prove him wrong, or yeah. you know, like whatever it is. Like, I mean, audience, I'm, I'm guessing you can think of things that you have done because someone said something, and so whether it was proving them right or proving them wrong or whatever, you know, there's probably scenarios that you've done something to prove somebody some way or another, to prove yes. something to somebody else, and instead of doing what you knew to be what you should be doing. You did oh, the other thing. Oh, yeah. I know I'm very guilty of that. I in uh, in my friend group, they knew that the way to get Joel to do something wasn't to tell, like, to dare him to do it. Tell him it you was, can't do that. It's no, not tell me I I can't do it. It's to say that's impossible. Oh, because okay. I will prove that it is possible. Even if I get hurt in the process, or if I get in trouble, I will prove. So you're the one we get to jump off the roof with a sheet as a parachute. No, I do the. I jump off the roof without the parachute because I knew I could land without breaking my legs, and I knew how to tumble correctly. So like I knew all the things, so that all these things that are like, oh, there's no way to do that. It's like, yeah, there is. <laughs> Give me a minute. And so like, but like th- that's what I'm talking about. Is like yeah. I was in my own way. I've gotten hurt plenty of times because other people were like, that's impossible. And yeah. so they weren't, 
most of those weren't theirs. If someone said like, hey, Joel, I dare you to do them, I'm like, no, that's stupid. But if someone's like, that's impossible, offhandedly, not pointed at me, I'd be like, I'm sure there's a way. And so like, I would get in my own way of living a yes. safe, healthy life yes. by going like, there's a way to do that. And, and so like, that's overall, that's what people need to get out of their own way. Yeah. And I say, get out of your own way. And for me, you know, I shout from the verse, God and the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, I shout that from the root. Yeah. I'm not saying that's right for you or anyone else. Sure. That's my yeah. belief in what works exactly. for me. Yeah. And so this book, is that from like, is it a Christian book or is this just a general like? It's, it's, a, it's secular. It's written from a psychological standpoint. Gotcha. I give examples. And then it's like, I got meditation exercises in it that it, like, one of the alternative nostril breathing. Okay, that's one of the exercises where you breathe in one nostril out the other. Interesting. You're going, that, you're going to have to plug your nostril and practice. It's probably going to take you a couple months to where you can do it without it. And now here's what the good thing about that is. It is okay. Now you, you know the mind. Mm -hmm. Your mind controls everything, right? Yeah. Okay, what's the one thing your mind can't control? Think. Uh, my brain's thinking about things. Um, it's heartbeat? It, no. What, what else? Um, well, the brain itself. What can it control? What do you have to do to live? Breathe? Yes. It can't control the breath. Oh, I learned how to do that a long time but ago because of my brother. <laughs> my older brother, uh, he learned how to be very quiet. And uh, so I learned how to be very quiet. So I, I learned that if I'm running and hiding, playing hide and seek, I learned how to stop running and quickly decelerate my breathing. So it's a nice calm like. Okay, but, but when you're breathing and doing concentrated breathing, mm -hmm. your mind can't control that. And you watch, like you, that's what I said, like you do the exercise and like meditation and that, mm. you know, you'll get the phantom inches to try to take you out of your center. And it will take you a lot to do, I mean, you've got listeners that meditate. Probably. And it's like, I used to, I wish I had time to get back. I could sit dead still for an hour. I wouldn't wow. move. I'd just sit there. I'd have phantom scratches and itches and, you know, drive me wild. That's and crazy. I'd have thoughts so come into me. Knowing that you have a ADD yes. is like, I'm sitting like, it, I have moments that I can do that. But like, I couldn't, I can't choose those moments. I, and I, I chose those and That's I was able, and one thing that helped was like, you get a thought in your brain is I quit calling them thoughts, and a guy who taught meditation said, call them noise. So when the thought would come up, I would call it noise. Oh, it's not. Now, it didn't allow me to follow it because it was just noise. Interesting. Like, you know, you think, oh, okay, I should have done this, and your mind goes uh -huh. 20 no, steps yeah, back. No, that's... Where when that thought comes in, you're uh, just noise. I can't, I can't even, I can't fathom that. Because my brain is always doing like 30 things at once. And like I've got like five thought processes trailing off in different directions like at all times. And so like trying to imagine being able to brush them away and stay in, present in the exact you, moment that I am is the, You do those meditation exercises religiously and learn them and get them practiced. Because here's what's good about them. Uh -huh. Once you've incorporated meditation and breathing... Mm -hmm. Like when you're getting agitated, your body remembers to breath. Yeah, I mean, instantly I, go to calm. I do use like breathing. I do deep breaths every once in a while to like recenter myself. Sometimes from yeah. like if I'm like getting overwhelmed, sometimes I'll just take a moment and do just like the long breaths. Um, I've taught a few other people how to do that. Of just like, yeah. And, like, just, like, in really stressful situations, I've learned how to do that. And I've taught a few other people that, like, I, one of my friends, like, he was like, my headache's going away. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, I do know that part, but, like, I'll have to look into that because that sounds very, like, if that works, that's an incredible thing for, for well, me. Well, and it takes practice because you're changing 
your whole compass. Right. You're changing your compass. You're fighting against everything that you are, which is your brain, mm -hmm. to get back into your body. Yeah. To listen to your body. Mm -hmm. Let your body tell you you can't jump off that roof and tumble right and not get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how well you tumble, to you're be still... fair, I never hurt myself jumping off of a roof. Okay, I've done it quite a few more times than I'd probably like to admit. But I've, I've never actually hurt myself yeah. from doing that. But it was one of those things that, like, it had a lot of potential. And that's me. what but, this is for. And everything for me, it's called stealing the brain enough to hear the non-dominant personalities, the loving Joel. Sure. The Joel who wants to be held. Yeah. No, he's not a loud mouth like the Joel that can jump off the roof or it's impossible, yet he gets brushed aside because the other parts of Joel are too busy. So when I can slow my mind down mm -hmm. and I get it, then those parts of me that don't get to see the light of day, I get to bring them into the light. Interesting. So for me, I'm I'm not like a lot of people in in, in certain oh, ways. Oh, neither am I. But so for me, as I was growing up, all those those different personalities, as you refer to them, are things that I have actively like segmented and named, so yes. that I know them. As like this is as a child growing up, like so yes. I grew up knowing like the voice of like the the negative thoughts. Like I knew those were negative thoughts. I knew those were bad thoughts. The only time I struggle, well, not the only time. I mean, I do still struggle listening to the right voices sometimes in my head, but my main struggle is when it comes to when, when my depression hits. When yes. depression hits, it, the negative, the downer side of me is the loudest by a very long shot, and it takes a lot of work for me to be like, even like going up to my friends and like being like, I need a hug. <laughs> You know, and it's something that only in the last probably five years I've been very vocal. Like when I feel the symptoms coming on, I'm t I tell my friends like, "Hey, my depression is going to be getting bad pretty soon," or like it's starting to get bad. And as I vocalize it more, it has become easier to be like, "I and just need one encouraging word, please." And, and that's what the book's about is right. sh t showing those patterns. And being mm -hmm. able to unravel them. Okay. And being able to see that, okay, you can, instead of staying silent, you speak it, you get your hug, you get your effort. It's, yeah. it's not as bad. Right. And as you said, you've learned over the years, it's diminished. Remember, you weren't built in one, one day. Right. You know, you're a culmination of yeah. your life. Yeah, and you there's can't a lot just, of small things that have yeah, added. There's you, a lot of big things that have yeah, added to that. You, like, add, you can't just throw all that away and yeah. think in one day man i've been doing inner work on myself for yeah. it's never going to end i'm well, telling you that yeah. it doesn't i thought it's like oh where's my ah. <laughs> yeah right yeah well i mean that kind of and like, i still got thoughts that come into my head sure and that just kind of makes me think of like the the disney movie inside out have you seen that oh, no. the one that's all it's all the emotions in the brain um, I think you'd really appreciate it with what we've been talking about. We've got Disney, so I'm going to watch yeah. it. Yeah, Inside Out. Is I it think, on Disney Plus? I believe so. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. Okay. Uh, they're working on the second one, so you're you're going to watch it, and then like a little bit later have the second one. Uh, I watched a funny one on Disney that I didn't know about my wife. She was, what are the uh, the f where you put the like the. The dead people, you do like the shrine, you put the orange flowers. Okay. Day of Dino uh, Morte. The Coco? Yeah, Coco. Okay. I watched that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, <laughs> you, the, you oh, know, sorry, let's get back on track a little bit. Okay. Because <laughs> I can talk about this movie all, all for all Okay, we're, focused. Uh, we're both focused. focused. <laughs> so, on Inside Out, they, it's like a, a child, and it's like the. the oh gosh, my memory's going to get challenged here. Um, I think it's like the five. Emotions or whatever. It's like anger, envy, or jealousy. I forget. Mad, sad, happy, glad. Yeah. Um, and they're like going through this uh, child and like dealing with the emotions and trying to react accordingly. And then they're like, they save memories and the memories are good or bad memories. And then they realize like towards the end. Well, I don't want to spoil it. Don't spoil it. 
Okay. I want to watch it. Okay. So Tonight. I can't. All right, cool. So everyone else knows what I'm talking about, but like <laughs> basically emotions get more complex and like things can, you know, I can experience a lot of different emotions at once. And like I've had parties that like I was sad, you know, like, I mean, I, I haven't said this on air, um, but like right before my wedding, I had a really bad depression. Like, and like, it was the point where like my bachelor party, I was depressed hanging out with all of my friends and I was very grateful because I, all, everyone was like saying good things. But like my memory of that is a overall good memory, even though I had some frustration, some stress, some anger, some that was self anger. Like I was not happy with myself. Um, I had some because of that, because of the depression, I had some bad perspective at certain points with some of my friends that I, you know, I cleared the error with. Um, but like all these other emotions went into this. But overall, when I look back at it, it's a good memory. Yeah. It's a it's a warming, heartwarming memory. And like, but let's, again, that's a lot of things that built up to that point where like, I can have this good memory despite the fact that I was yeah. depressed, despite the fact that I was stressed pretty much to the max because yeah. things weren't going well up into like, and again, I had a loving now wife that was supporting me through that as we moved yeah. towards that. And it was never something between us. It was like family and it was like plans that were going awry and stuff like that. But like, that's a lot of building. And if I were to look at that moment and try and like distill it down to like one thing that caused it, there's nothing. Like there's not one moment. It's the, you know, my brain's built a little different, a bit differently. So depression is something that my brain happens. It like doesn't produce the right chemicals. And then, you know, there's the timing and there's the, all these different things that like throughout my life built up to that being able to be a good memory, but all the other things also have elements of different parts of my life. And so, well, and that's like with me, with my mom passing <clears throat> and going through everything I'm going mm -hmm. with that, you know, I got a very good perspective that not a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. It's like life sucks and it's hard. But the mm -hmm. one thing I remind myself is I'm not in a cage flashing my light to have them open the door so I can go to yard. Right. <laughs> so, honestly, mm -hmm. can anything out here be that bad, bad to where I'm going to let it get me? Right. You know, I got to I gotta be happy. You know, it's yeah. like life's precious. I lost too much life to let myself get dogged down. Right. In all the... All the minutia mm -hmm. that I can make and one thing once like you you've done the work to identify know when you're when you're starting to go to your places you a see, lot yeah. of people don't have that yeah and that's what that book's about right is that book helps them identify and then they can work on that and be able to do what you do Joel you know it's coming, so you start, so, okay, I need this, I need it. Right. You can see it coming before it hits. Right. Because usually once something is there, it's too, <laughs> it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got to catch it before it's like the rock yeah. rolling down a hill. <laughs> if you can catch it right before it starts rolling, you could stop right. it. But you that let it get like... rock is not yeah, easy you get, you get a rock once it's got some momentum, it's yeah. going to roll over you. Right, and, that, and that's that's pretty much what the book's for. Gotcha. With the breathing, with the exercises, with mm -hmm. the poetry I put in it, it's to be able to help you to be able to identify and do exactly what you're doing, Joel. Awesome. Okay. I mean, I'm very curious to check this out now and like read it and see like what it can do to help me. Because um, like, I mean, there's always room for growth. Is something that I always try and say. It's oh like, yes. I don't care how good I am at something. There's always I could be the foremost expert. That doesn't mean I'm done. No. <laughs> so, you no, know, exactly. I'm curious to check out the book and, and, and see how that works for me. And, you know, audience, if you want to check it out, like I said, it'll be in the description um, for you to check out. Buy it. If it's interest, if it sounds interesting, if it's something that you think will help you, please check it out and support him for that. Yeah. Um, so I got a few, a few more questions. Um, not many, because we talked about a lot of it. You know, usually I ask people like, what are like, what's your favorite part of this whole experience? And what was your least favorite? But like, you kind of talked about, I think you've touched on pretty much all of those. And like, <laughs> what was difficult? What was easy? You know? And it's like, I guess specifically with the authorship, 
right? Writing the actual book. Were there any things in that that like really stood out to you of like, this was really difficult in that process or something that was well, like really it, easy in that process? And it is. And here's what I found too. Okay. <clears throat> is it's like I first learned to type. Sure, yeah. Typing on a typewriter. <laughs> People don't know what a typewriter is nowadays. But that's <laughs> where you type, and uh -huh. it goes on paper. Directly, yeah. Okay, I self-taught myself computers. Sure. And when I was writing all my parole plans to go to the board to get let out of prison, mm -hmm. by their grace, you got to be able to write insight letters. Like, you got to be able to show them, okay, this was my pattern and the causative factor for this behavior. Mm -hmm. This is how I won't go back to that behavior. Gotcha. So what I found that was hard, like even when I was doing those and even in the authorship, mm -hmm. is when you're writing on a computer screen, you second guess and want to go back and change it because you don't have to throw a whole piece of paper away like a typewriter. Right. I, so huh. you just got to trust that what you put down is right. And that mm -hmm. was hard writing that book. It's like I would erase it and write the paragraph again. I and I really finally had to that. just say, I'll, you know, no, I, no, I, I'm, I'm done. Uh -huh. Because I, I would find that was the hardest thing about writing on it. Any, any writing I do, mm -hmm. I do. I, I teach at my church. I do kingdom trainings at my church. You mm -hmm. know, I've done 10 of them. Mm -hmm. You know, where I teach there, and like every time, what I do with those is I just lay out talking points. Uh -huh. I don't really put too many paragraphs, and I just let the Holy Spirit sure. usually, coming from the cuff, comes off better for me. But even when I'm doing that, you want to just do it over too many times. Right. And you just got to trust that what came out of the brain was right. Yeah, I never really thought about like a, a typewriter being more of a solid thing that it like it's a it's a physical waste of resources if you don't like if you throw that page away that is a physical and waste you gotta of stuff. physically type your whole page again yeah even it's what not, you don't want to change like a, oh okay that one sentence let me let me change it from the to a that okay that makes so much more sense you know you have to like, if you see them as you have to throw that page away, I never really thought, like, that means you have to redo that. Like, if you're at the bottom of the page and realize you made a mistake, you have to redo that whole thing. So, like, that makes you more sure of, like, I typed it. That's it. That's it. Done. <laughs> yes. Huh. That, I never really thought about that. Like, But when you're on a screen where you can It's really just... easy to, like, no. Okay. Oh, uh, no. Oh, yeah. that's and better. And that was... That was the hard part about gotcha. trying to just get it done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, no, that's not good enough. Oh, no, I need to change. No, no, you know, just second guessing. And that was what was the hardest thing to write that. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a lot of it while I was up here at the camp. When I yeah. bring the trailer up, yeah. that's when I was, I went through a lot of it. And I finally just said, okay, stop. I got to be done with it. Just gotta right. go for better or for worse. Yeah, you know it's it's a culmination mm. of what I've seen work for me and yeah. countless others in yeah. a hopeless environment that you know I changed my life in. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was the hard part is like letting go of the project yes. itself almost. Yeah, just trusting that what's on there is right. What the work you've put in is what needs to be there. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. Um, what's something, like, if you could, like, public service announcement style, like, tell everybody, like, one quick thing that you wish you, you wish more people knew, like, something that you not quite get tired of telling people, but you wish you didn't have to tell every single person, like, something like that. Do you have anything that fits in that? Yeah, I, I kind of do. Okay, shoot. And what I love, and it's on my wall, mm -hmm. and it's from a, this too shall pass. That's a really, like, powerful <laughs> but short little thing. But honestly, I mean, this yeah. too shall pass. No matter what kind of minutia or poop I'm in, uh -huh. Oh, it's going to pass, and I'm going to have a deeper mound the next time I step. 
But this one I'm in now, it's going to pass. That's this really... too shall pass. And Man, that's... Just being able to let go of things Yes, is, yeah, that's a, that's a deep one. <laughs> oh, I can't take credit for that one. Well, I, I know. I, I, I'm trying to think of what that's from, though. I, my brain is like, it's familiar. That's, that's from a literature, from Alcoholics Anonymous, which oh. I still go to. I speak at conventions. And it's like, I spoke at... One we'll go into this is a little bit off topic, but okay. like my passion. Okay, they've got a program within AA. It's called Bridging the Gap. Okay. <clears throat> and what that is is that's a program that people coming out of prison and treatment facilities, it gets them right stay meetings. It gets some sponsors. Mm-hmm. Like people that have a drug problem, a lot of times, say like you got a drug problem, mm-hmm. you go to treatment center, your treatment center times up, you go right back to the neighborhood where you were at. Right. Well, this would give you someone that'd be willing to come and take you to a meeting, help you work your steps, Mm -hmm. help you with that. Well, I went and spoke at their convention. And after I spoke, we were going around and I said, okay, what do you, what, you know, what do you want to get from this weekend? And it's all purely volunteers Mm -hmm. just wanting to be of service. And so everyone was talking from all over the United States, Canada. And it came to me, and I said, okay, what do you want? I said, look, just remember in your struggles, your strife, when you're ready to give up, I'm your success story. Mm-hmm. I'm the product of what you're fighting for. Right. Me and all the other guys inside just like me that were trapped in that addiction. So when you're feeling down, uh-huh. know that what you're doing is... Sorry, my you're, brain just caught up to you. You're talking to the... People that from Bridge the App, not the people that are helping. You're talking to the people, the volunteers the vol- trying to help. Yes, and you're saying, "Hey, I'm somebody that now is in the spot that you're trying to get other people." Yes. Okay, that's really cool. Sorry, I thought you're talking to the people they're ta- like they were helping. No, like, this was their convention. Yeah. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah. I mean that that's. I know that that can be a very very motivational thing to see like. This is okay. This is what we've been working on and stuff like that. If you don't mind me asking, how long have you been, you know, like what's your chip or whatever? I'm coming up on March 13th. It'll be 16 years. 16 years. Wow. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty solid success story for (laughs) for them, you know, being able to go like, yeah, 16 years out of, especially out of your past, like that, that very, very, very dark past yeah. to 16 years clean, Sunday school teacher, author of a self-help book, <laughs> you know, worked at a summer camp as one of the nicest cooks, you know. Well, and that's what, and that shows like God is this camp and that job, which was only by the Holy Spirit that I got it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. that was what I was needed because that allowed me to become Mm re-acclimated without the judgment I was afraid of because of my past. You know, I was in a Christian camp and, you know, you guys pretty much accepted me for who I was now, not who I had been. Well, uh, for me, I know that, I, I mean, it wouldn't change much, but I didn't know about your past until, like, I think, like, halfway, almost almost the end of, of my, first, my first summer working with you. Like, I didn't know, and I was like, when I was told, I was like, Robert? Really? <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> Murderer? I don't think so. Yeah. He's a really nice, gentle guy that cooks breakfast for us. <laughs> what do you mean he murdered somebody? <laughs> Yeah. Like it was like, and see, I, I think of myself as a very non-judgmental person. Like, even if I had known that, I don't think it would have changed much, um, except for like the initial like meeting of like, okay, I mean, I know that our camp's not going to be like, yeah, he murdered someone like two weeks ago. He got acquitted. We're pretty sure. <laughs> like I knew like, we're not going to be hiring somebody that they weren't sure of. But like, yeah. I also, I'm the type of person that like, it's who you are. I don't yeah, care what that, you've done because I know a lot of people that have done a lot of things, yeah. but that's not who they are. But like it was, it's for me, it spoke a lot of like the transformation, the fact that like 
had someone else not told me directly, like, yeah, no, he went to prison for murder, I would not have ever guessed. Like, and that's, you know, and Robert that's strikes me as someone that's probably killed someone. Like, it, yeah. it wouldn't have crossed and, my and mind. And see, that's what shows the transformation of the Holy yeah. Spirit. Yeah. He changed me. I couldn't change myself. Sure. You know, I had to get out of my own way and let the Holy yeah. Spirit work. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought I'd be teaching? You know, you can go to <laughs> Living Hope Anza and they're under kingdom training. Uh, I, I I do those, you know, like every, every couple months when we're yeah. doing it. You know, it's like, I lay out Bible studies, you know. I, I mentor people, mm-hmm. you know. I try and work with kids, you know. I, I just don't life, you know, with what I'm dealing with. Elderly parents, one passing, mm-hmm. newly married, really haven't had our time yet. You know, the yeah. first year we got married, it was COVID. Oh, the sec- gosh. The second year. I never thought about that. Yeah, the second year, my mom got sick. Bad. Mm-hmm. Now, my dad's Parkinson's is really bad. So now we're deciding whether to move him in with us. So now we can't decide to just take off because someone's got to be there to watch him. Yeah. So my brother is there, and you know how family goes with <laughs> brothers. You know, so it's like, but one thing I do is I stick with my program. Right. That's And my wife supports me in that. That's good. You know, it's like, that's, I need that, and that's that's my recharge and my minutia mm-hmm. that keeps me, you know, like you call for this podcast. Yeah. You know, it was... A good, re- good, good reacher. I mean, even if no one listens to us, it's just yeah. us. Yeah, you know, it's like, man, it's it lifted my spirits, and yeah. it was. You called it the time I need to be called. You could have called me two weeks ago. <laughs> it wouldn't have been the right time. Yeah, there's no thing as timing. You know, yeah. I believe God, the Holy Spirit, is moving me the way He wants me to move, mm-hmm. and it's not in my time, but His time. I wish you'd tell me what his plan was for him, <laughs> but he still failed to do that. I wish yeah. I could still be at the cozy camp up here working. <laughs> I, yeah. I really I really don't enjoy my hours of commute. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like this is this is heaven. This mm. is a little little safe haven that you know, luckily we're in because of COVID. Now I was able to get the big cabin. And if I ever don't reserve it for the next year, it'll be gone. <laughs> I told yeah. my wife that. I go, look, yeah. the minute we don't reserve it, you'll ne- we'll never be able to get in there again. Yeah. Because people have been going to that same cabin for 30, 40 years. Yeah. And it's booked year-round yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so got a few more questions, okay. and then uh, we'll probably wrap up. Um, so... I got, I got two, and I'm, my brain was trying to remember which one comes first because I think I wrote them out of order this time. Um, so I asked you, like, if there's anything anybody else you know. Um, if you could go back in time to – and I'll leave when exactly you go back in time to. But if you were to give yourself advice, whether it was – right when you started prison or when it was at that turning point, what did like, and then you can pick when you would want to give yourself advice when you think it would actually settle. But like, what would be advice that you'd give yourself? Well, I would, the advice I give myself would probably go back to like four or five years old. Okay. And it would be that I'm not a reject and a retard that I'm just me. That yeah, would, that would that, that, that would, that would be life changing. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I wish more people. I wish more people knew that. Like, you know, I I spend a lot of my time as a friend, like telling my friends, like, "Hey, no, you're not stupid. You're not. You're not." Like, I have a lot of people like, "Oh, I'm just uh, some sort of weirdo." I'm like, I prefer being a weirdo because that means I can be myself and not like yeah. some quote unquote normal person yeah and that but. that's that's why I go back to because mm-hmm. see it's like one thing do this funny when you go to the board you got to answer the questions on behavior so they asked they asked me okay so when you committed your murder da 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 
when did it start? What made you? And I said, uh, uh, my 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 case started when I was 11 years old. He goes, what? I go, mm. my case started when I thought it was okay to drink and do mm. stuff I wasn't supposed to do. That's that's when my crime started. It was a an inevitability that I was going to do what I did. So when you were you were talking about that, you actually went back to like yeah. the first sign you saw of like. Well, yeah, yeah, if this hadn't happened, this None all the way over here. And when here, you choose this lifestyle, yeah, that's, it's, it's that's a, inevitable. Yeah, it's a very, very improbable thing to get out of. Yeah. Interesting. That's a, I, that's a very, <laughs> you're very deep today. <laughs> very like, be yourself. It's like, and, and what oh. was funny, the, the, the other thing they asked you at the board uh, and I, I give this people example, and they always love it. Mm-hmm. And I say, okay, they ask, here's the first question. Okay, Mr. Hofstadt, mm-hmm. you know, you killed somebody 25 years ago. How do we know if we let you out, you won't do it again? Now, if someone asked you that question, what would you answer? I. That's a big, big uh, hypothetical for me because I'd have to think about what would cause me to kill somebody in the first place? Um, I mean, say it was I, accidental. So I would have to like, I'd have to look at like, okay, twenty five years. Like, I would have to say probably like the actions that I've had. Like, I, okay. you know, you don't see that. If, if I was to put myself in your shoes, I would probably be using the the defense of like, well, you've seen my. When's the last time I beat somebody up? When's the last time I okay, stabbed somebody? It's, it's even simpler than that. Okay. And here's what I told him that floored him. Okay. Is I said, I know killing somebody's wrong now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that he was like waiting for me to go into my long spill. And I, he's like, huh? Like, you could believe I stopped talking. Well, what do you mean? Well, I have a conscience now. Interesting. I know breaking the law is wrong. Because, so, sorry, I, did, I guess I didn't do a, I, pretty pretty good usually but at you putting did, myself in someone's But someone's, you did the same thing 95% of every other person. Sure. Did. Well, the actions, I did this. Mm. No one comes out and says, hey, I it's, it's wrong, wrong to break the law. Right. And I, I didn't think about the fact that, like, with Hard Robert, that kind of, like, it's it's whatever. I need to survive, and I need to do whatever I need to do to be in this lifestyle. And if that means that I need to pull this out and shoot somebody, that's what it means, you yeah, know. I mean, and I it thought, wasn't a, a a decision of like, hmm, I know it's wrong to shoot him, but I'm going to do it anyway. And yeah. so, like that transformation in prison changed that perspective to yes. like, dude, what I did that was very oh. wrong and I know that now I didn't before I have a change mentality on now life. you understand how that's more insight than well my actions yeah. when I was this I mean I no longer do this I'm not this. that's a perspective change you know but it's that's, not that's a full perspective change versus like looking back at a record that's that's a, a, a mentality change you know and that that speaks volumes versus just like See, I haven't done this in so long. I haven't done that. You know, it's a, I understand. That's an understanding. That's a fundamental understanding of life. And you would be surprised how many people don't understand. I asked all kinds of other lifers because I help people inside prepare to go to board. Mm -hmm. And that's the simple question I asked. I said, they don't want to hear nothing. They just say, it's wrong. Yeah. Well, how do you know it's wrong? Well, now I'm a Christian. I believe in the Bible and thou shalt not kill. I try and live my life by Ephesians 5. Love thy neighbor. Do this. Mm-hmm. That's how I live my... I even quoted scripture at my board hearing and that's <laughs> usually unheard of. Sure. You know, yeah. and it's like I just floored him. That commissioner yeah. really didn't know how to act. Because <laughs> I, I read people's eyes, you know. I yeah. read people as a... And you could see that just straight... Florida beyond belief. <laughs> it's wrong. Yeah. I mean, I, see, it, I guess this is one of those, like, if you'd asked, like, my, not my lawyer legalized brain of mine, the one that can read legalese and, like, read pages and pages in a few minutes, I probably would have answered, like, 
if you were to ask me, like, why would you not kill somebody in the first place, I would just say it's wrong. <laughs> so, like, but if I, like, put it in that perspective, yeah, my brain overcomplicated it. And, like, yeah, well, these the records, it's like that. But, yeah, I mean, that's the very simple answer is I wouldn't kill somebody because it's wrong. And if I, I almost said that, too. I was like, well, I couldn't imagine me killing somebody in the first place because it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I, I'm trying to, like, overthink this. <laughs> And that's, that's the main thing I wrote the book for, too, is most people overthink. Sure, yeah. It's too much overthinking, and mm-hmm. when I overthink, I just get spinning my wheels. It's Here's what I tell people. Here's the best way I put my brain in. I, I share this in a, okay, I got a hamster wheel in my head. Okay. I got a hamster. He's on the bench doing bench presses. <laughs> Okay. He's running on the treadmill. Uh huh. And he's telling me, he goes, You're going to let me back on that wheel. Now, here's the kicker he can spin that wheel really fast. Once that wheel gets spinning really fast, I lose my thought process. Now, I might be tempted to go back there because I'm just running, like you said. My brain's going a mile a minute. Uh-huh. So I, that's why I tell people, I got to keep them off that. But he's sitting there right there. He's running on a treadmill. He's driving. He's pumping weights. He's yoked up, mm-hmm. waiting for me to let him back on the wheel. And I'm not. Okay, gotcha. So I, I was not I was not sure where the whole like exercising came into it. So he wants to get back on. He's prepped to get back on, and you're just not letting him get back yes. on. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. That's it. That's well. That's the way my mind. Yeah. No, my I, mind doesn't work. I, I normally really either. like hearing people like how people's thought process go on. And I talk. I talk to a lot of different people about like what the thought process, and that's an interesting thing of like not letting him go get away with just running on. Yeah. You know? Okay. Um, so if I have, I have a question. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. If you had like a magic snap, you could say like genie-esque string, no strings attached, like could take your passion to the nth degree. What would that look like? Would that be like having like dedicated, like, uh, centers around the world that are dedicated to helping people transition. That's, or... that, that would be it. So go ahead and describe it. Like, let your imagination would, run wild. My Again, imagination this is all magic. No. running wild would be my, my own channel, you know, just speaking to masses, having treatment facilities that take okay. you all the way through, that let you live in, have businesses that give you jobs, that okay. you only get to keep them for five years, and then that allows you to build a resume. Then you go out into the real world, and you okay. can get a job. And just being so able pretty cool. much to support from cradle to cradle of your, not if and as a baby, but when you start changing your thoughts. Like, mm-hmm. hey, I don't want to be a thug anymore. I don't want to be this. Right. Be able to take you, and then not kick you out of the program if you slip. Because I slipped a lot of times till sure. it finally took. Something that has a little bit more grace. Gotcha. A lot of grace. Yeah, because, I mean, it's it's a hard... It's and just hard being able to, to go speak and, sure. you know, that... I, I like that idea of, like, you... Like, what you're describing, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's the whole bridge, basically. You know, you're talking about bridge and gap earlier, but this is, like, the whole bridge from, like, they get out, you have a job lined up for them, they have a place to stay... You know, they're working through curriculum, you know, and then once they're not just rehabilitated, quote unquote, by what this like the prison system says, like, you know, you're rehabilitated to here, go into this new world that you've never experienced (laughs) in the last 25 years. You're talking about from there going like, okay, let's actually get you acclimated to this world, give you some job history in this real world, and then... Once you're ready to actually fully step foot by yourself into the world, here you go. And here's, you have money, you have a resume that has something in the last 25 years, a steady yeah. job. And, you know, you have this work that you got under your belt. Here you go. Here's actual life. Now. And even pre-COVID, I did a, I, my, my book I wrote, I wrote a curriculum on it too. 
Okay. And I was teaching it before COVID is just self-help, okay. you know, and it's like, you know, to go a little bit deeper on it. And each chapter's got like reflection questions for sure. you to go back and ask, but that would be it. Okay. You know, That's to a- just give, give everybody a chance. So you guys, know. if you go buy his book, you'll be slowly supporting that dream. <laughs> <laughs> I need some big donors, eh? <laughs> big donors. <laughs> but okay, that's really cool. Um, is there anything else that I missed? Anything that we I, really... I can't. I can't think of anything. I I take pleasure in people's answers, and that's that's the answer because that means I did my job well. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Podcast um, of the year, Joel. Here's, <laughs> here's Joel. Joel. Thank you. Um, so you you said your uh, do you want to just plug your book really quick? Uh, yeah, it's on it's it's on Amazon. You know, it's freeing the child inside you by Robert Hofstadt. You know, you can put the link on it. Yeah. You know, and you want to have fun and see some other stuff. You know, you 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 just Google my name and you can watch some videos of while I'm still inside doing outreach. You can see my first day of being released from prison. So do you have a YouTube channel that people can I got a YouTube channel too, but I just would life. I haven't had time to update okay, it. But, but if it, they want to catch up on, on yeah. your previous content, yeah. what, what's your YouTube channel called? Uh, Robert Hofstadt. Just nice and name. simple. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I'll put a link to that in the description okay. below as well as the book. Um, Robert, thank you so much oh, for coming no, on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I mean, I we've had talks before, but this is the most in-depth conversation we've had about like everything that went into things. So like, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure for me personally to oh, have yeah. this conversation. I'm glad other people get to hear this too. Yeah, so, me too. Thank you so much. Um, so again, uh, for all of you listening, um, Braden Slens, uh, the roller coaster enthusiast, is still dropping new uh, YouTube videos. Um, I, it's, gosh, I almost forgot the name. It's uh, Zero Credits and Counting, so go check that out. I will let you know when my episode drops. I'm on there. I'm one of his guests. Uh, a big shout out to Moana Dodd for the cover art for my podcast. She's a graphic design artist. Uh, check her out on Instagram at Milana's Designs. She's very good. She's amazing. Uh, she she <laughs> designed mine. Uh, everything that I like, I, I gave her some quick feedback, and she made it basically the perfect icon for for my show. Um, so go check out her stuff. Uh, she does amazing work. Um, if you have any comments uh, for me about how I can run the show better, any questions that you think I should be asking uh, my guests. Um, or if you have guests that I should be interviewing, please let me know. You can find me on Instagram at Curious Joelcast, on Twitter at Joel Circo, or email me at Curious Joelcast, Curious Joelcast at gmail.com. Um, also, if you like what you've been hearing, please share this episode with somebody that you think would enjoy it or the whole show. If they think they'd enjoy the whole show, share it with them, let them listen. Um, and subscribe for updates on my next episode. Uh, Thank you all so much for listening, and I'll catch you all on the next episode.